this is the biggest predator in the ocean, the great white shark. It can reach six meters in length and weigh in at over 2,000 kilograms. A supreme hunter equipped with rows of serrated teeth and an arsenal of super senses. An encounter with this apex predator in its own element is the stuff of nightmares for most, an experience only few would actively seek. Adventure Ocean Quest. An encounter with a world under the waves. with divers who become underwater beings themselves. They work together with scientists on all the world's oceans. Deep under the surface of the water. Without a sound and without a breath. Adventure in the depths of the sea, the likes of which has never been seen before. Three extraordinary divers are on their way to undertake the experiment of a lifetime. They're heading to the notorious hunting grounds of one of the most feared predators on the planet, the island of Guadalupe. This dedicated team of experts is preparing to launch a unique expedition into the realm of the great white shark. Their aim is to contribute to cutting edge research into the true nature of this legendary beast. They'll go face to face with great whites in their own element. Their only protection, years of experience and incredible self-control. They want to challenge the popular myth of an aggressive, bloodthirsty monster. I think what we do is really bringing powerful images that are able to change people's opinion. He's the master of the sea. He's the absolute hunter. He's at the top of the food chain and fears no one. This is almost the top predator in the ocean, and it has the myth behind it. I'm more afraid than to live in a world without sharks than to meet sharks in the water. San Diego, California. The expedition prepares for their extraordinary journey on board of the Islander. Amongst the crew members, three of the best free divers in the world. The Belgian Frédéric Bouilly, former world record holder that has now devoted himself to underwater photography. The Canadian record holder, William Winram. And world champion Pierre Froulat von Monaco managed to go below the 127 meter mark. They're ready to begin their journey into Pacific waters. Highly specialized camera equipment is part of their comprehensive kit to capture a meeting between man and beast unlike anything ever seen before. The isolated volcanic island of Guadalupe lies 250 kilometers off the Mexican mainland, a day's journey by boat. Time to discuss the immense task ahead. Cameraman Christian Petron brings almost 50 years as a renowned underwater cinematographer to the table. Eventually, the island of Guadalupe appears on the horizon. A harsh, barren rock without any fresh water. Only a handful of fishermen have settled here. Fur and elephant seals enjoy the peace and tranquility and were found in huge numbers right up to the 19th century. Then, the greed of human hunters all but exterminated them.
The hunters brought goats with them, which soon eradicated the island's natural vegetation cover. Fortunately, the rocky cliffs gave shelter to a few surviving Guadalupe fur seals and northern elephant seals. Over the last century, their population has slowly begun to recover. Today, the island is a strictly protected nature reserve. Only one hunter is still allowed to pursue seals around here, the great white shark. The new thing in Guadalupe is, of course, the amount of sharks. There are more sharks, they are easier to find. In South Africa, we need to do long boat trips uh, and spend hours and hours before seeing a shark. Apparently, there's more than 150 sharks in the area in the big bay, so that's a lot of animals. And at some point, they will come across us. Uh, so that's the main difference. Uh, the other difference is that the visibility is really better than in South Africa. So most of the, the people say that the, the sharks are more uh, fast and more aggressive than in South Africa, probably because of visibility. Uh, so that could be uh, not in our favor, because it means the shark could spot us from very deep water and rocket to the surface. Um, in my opinion, that won't happen, because the great white shark is an apex predator and he never, he never takes risk to get a prey. So he will first come around us and check us out to see what we are and how we react. So I don't think we will be really bothered by the, the visibility. But as a lot of people told us that, we will be very careful for the first dives. But the crew is not yet complete. The Mexican marine biologist, Dr. Mauricio Hoyos, joins the team on board. Hey. Hi, Fred. How are you? Fine, you? How was the trip? Good, huh? Good condition. Flat sea. No waves. Comfortable. For five months a year, he is based on the island to conduct his field research. Hey. <laughs> Good to see you. Mauricio specializes on the hunting behavior of great white sharks and hopes the free divers will enable him to find out more about their natural behavior in these coastal waters. Will they perceive the free divers as a threat? Will they attack? Or will they tolerate them? But this experiment is very risky. Safety driver Luke Tipple is in charge of planning the dives. He has constructed a special cage for the dives that will be suspended around 10 meters below the water surface. It will serve as a launching pad for the free divers and will grant protection for the camera team that will remain within the safety of the cage. Luke will only be able to watch the free divers' backs in the open water. The rest is up to them. Diving without a cage or protective gear means the divers are completely exposed. Captain Shane Slaughter shares his thoughts with the crew. Just the only one thing I would add about the sharks is if you see them down deep and you see any of them tilted on their side a little bit, like they're looking up at you, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a red flag. Also, any of them that, you know, if they're not swimming level on the water and you're up here, the shark is here, and if they swim sideways a little bit like that, they're eyeing you for some, some reason. And that's one thing that I've seen diving in there. It's an indicator one of them's gonna come up at some point. So just watch for that. Anything additional which might help us? Um, other than recommending you guys don't go in the water without a cage? No. <laughs> <laughs> Diving cages are used across the world for secure dives with sharks. To lure sharks into the vicinity of the cages, blood and fish are usually used as bait. It provides a cheap thrill for tourists, since the blood and carcasses provoke the shark's aggressive feeding instinct and trigger a feeding frenzy. I'm very pleased with the cage. Uh, I designed it specifically to offer both surface and uh, underwater support and to be able to be pushed away from the main vessel. Uh, great white sharks attack from deep cover. 
you pretty much always see the shark coming from underneath the boat in the shadow. Being able to push our cage and our uh, surface support away from the boat offers less places for the shark to come from. I communicate with them uh, with my uh, stick, so I, I use a metallic banging to, uh, to get their attention and then we use signals like uh, two sharks and they confirm two sharks. If I'm saying three sharks and they're saying two sharks, that means that there's one more that they don't see that they need to be aware of. Uh, that's one of my primary jobs down there other than just looking after the camera guys is making sure that I'm seeing that bit below where they can't, uh, which can be an issue. That extra 30, 40, 50 feet of visibility um, can mean the difference between there being two sharks and five sharks. Paramedic Tiffany Potker is a vital member of the team. Should a diver get injured in a shark attack, she may well be their only hope of survival, and she is only too aware of the risks involved in this experiment. I try to think, as far as preparation goes, what could be worst case scenario. You know, we're, we're a few hours out of range for Coast Guard here, and we would have to meet them a couple hours going towards San Diego if this were like worst case scenario. So, Worst case scenario, yes, a shark attack. Say a wound were to be on, on your thigh here, you'd put the tourniquet above that. Um, you're cutting off circulation to the rest of the limb too, so that's your last ditch effort. You know, you want to save the limb if possible as well, but it's life over limb, so. Hopefully I won't have to work, but I know there's a good chance that I may. Everything is set for the first diving attempt. Will the sharks come? How long will it take before they show up? Oh, yeah. Then, big one, huh? <laughs> the crew spots a shadow yeah, yeah, in the water. Yeah. A massive shadow. We will not have lunch today. Enfin, the shark, perhaps, but not us. Yeah, it's just yeah. about four meters, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But thick. Time for cameraman Christian Petron and his team to get ready. As far as I'm concerned, a diver using the rebreather technique, like me, is the same as a free diver. He doesn't make any noise and no bubbles. A scuba diver using compressed air makes lots of bubbles and lots of noise and disturbs the sharks. Like I just said, a free diver and a diver using the rebreather technique are more or less the same because they don't disturb the sharks because they don't make bubbles and because they don't make any noise. But using a rebreather also carries serious risks. Should the proportion of oxygen mixed into the reused air be too low, the diver will fall asleep underwater forever. Everyone knows exactly what they're doing. This experiment has been meticulously planned. But now all bets are off. No one knows exactly what will happen once the three free divers are in the water. Dr. Mauricio Hoyos is watching the proceedings intently. If you are diving, you have to hold your breath because if you if you uh, emit these bubbles, the shark is going to go away. When we were diving yesterday, and the shark was uh, really close to us, but when it heard the, the bubbles, it was away from us. We wanted to take pictures, but we couldn't because we were going off with the bubbles. But with this, with free diving, it's perfect because no sound. So I think that the shark doesn't feel like uh, threatened. Then a bizarre turn of events. As soon as the divers get into the water, the shark that a moment ago was calmly circling the boat has vanished. These huge hunters can materialize and disappear in a split second, even in the crystal clear waters of the Pacific. Yet another reason to be extremely cautious. Pierre searches the depths for any signs of sharks.
Perhaps he can attract the shark? Some free divers are able to reach incredible depths of over 130 meters in the open ocean and stay underwater for over seven minutes. But these are record-breaking dives. In this situation, they're unlikely to exceed depths of around 50 meters and may stay there for up to five minutes. This incredible ability is a result of extreme physical training and incredible self-control to overcome the breathing reflex. Suddenly, they catch a glimpse of movement far below. As the shark returned to investigate the divers, the shadow doesn't approach them. William decides to turn the tables on the shark and approaches it. How will the predator react? The shark doesn't accept the challenge. Once again, he vanishes into the blue of the ocean. The divers can't get anywhere near the shark. This killer could make short work of each of the divers with just a single bite, but it cautiously stays away. He decides how close they can come. There are no signs of aggression, but also no fear. Against all expectations, this first shark encounter has exposed the great whites as cautious, even shy animals. If you go in front of them, they can be afraid. So they take a distance. It's called a security distance. For every animal, they have their own security distance. With the big sharks, it's new for them to have uh, free divers in the water. Yes, okay, yes. Actually, there's going to be a meeting. Dr. Mauricio Hoyos has worked with sharks for years and explains his research strategy. He fits sharks with transmitters that allow him to track their movements closely. Last year, I set uh, three receivers on this bay, and I tagged the sharks with uh, pingers. So with these pingers, you can know just the absence and the presence of the sharks. I tagged the sharks in October, and I saw that they were here in October, November, December, January, and February, most of them. And suddenly, they disappeared. With other kind of uh, satellite transmitters, they have found that the sharks can go as far as Hawaii, and also to one spot between Hawaii and Guadalupe Island, and they remain there for about 160 days, and then they come again to Guadalupe Island. So with that, you will be able to see where they get the seal, how they predate on them somehow, exactly. because you can see where they are in the water column. Exactly, the predatory movements when the shark is chasing the, the seal. Maybe I will be able to, to see if other sharks are together, if they are uh, hunting together, because that's one theory, that the white sharks can hunt together. Do you think we can help you by our free dive with the, the great white and our cameras? you think we can help you somehow? Yes, I think. I think that it would be really important for me to identify the shark. So if you could look for the conspicuous uh, characteristics, such as uh, birthmarks or scars, or even the pigmentation patterns of the gills, mm -hmm. the pelvic fins and the tail, that would be great. If you could take pictures of left and right side, that would be amazing. Also, if you can take footage or even see the, the behavior underwater, because it's really different when they are at the surface feeding that when they are deep below the, the, the surface. Maybe we can try to, if you could uh, try to tag the sharks. And we, I mean, but that, that's what I need now, trouble. because on the surface, it's going to be impossible. The next day brings bad news. Storm clouds are gathering. Conditions deteriorate rapidly. The shark experiment grinds to an abrupt halt. All of a sudden, the wind changed from the valley to this direction here. So this is what we've got. It's cold. The divers get out of the water quickly. The waves threaten to throw the cage against the boat. It has to be lifted. The paramedic has to deal with her first casualty. 
Pierre collided with a jellyfish in the water, a very painful encounter. I need a medic. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> dangerous, ah, uh, this here. So dangerous. Sting right on the lip. White shark, <laughs> jellyfish. As the storm intensifies, the boat's anchor threatens to tear loose. It has to be lifted. I think we're gonna run down to the south end and see if we can get out of this wind. There's no time to lose. They have to seek shelter in a bay. They stand no chance of finding the sharks in this weather. Wind, waves, and currents are all working against them. But Captain Snotter has other ways of keeping track of the great whites. We're gonna try to actively try to find uh, good shark action here for the next couple days. Real similar in the way that we look for fish. Uh, we basically use the side scan sonar and we pick up schools of tuna anywhere from, you know, maybe uh, 10 pounds all the way up to, you know, 80 or 100 pounds. So it's really easy for us to see a 3,000 pound shark on sonar. So we'll sweep around the different areas and if we see a good possibility for sharks, we'll uh, go ahead and start our operations there. Okay, you guys ready to go find sharks? Okay, let's go. But while the team has no choice but to wait for the sharks, Pierre has found a distraction. A young storm petrel has become stranded on board. Uh, they used to see the, um, the lights on the boat during the night, and they come on the boat. It's very small. It's called a frigate in French. I don't know in English. And he's wet. He needs to be dried. And he seems to be not in good form, huh? so he needs help. And he can't, he can't uh, fly, you see? He wants to move, but he can't fly, so we try to help him, to feed him, and we will see, huh? Now, we go in a hot place to help the bird. Look at him. We could help him, perhaps. We have to feed him. It's difficult to feed a, a, a bird like that. Huh? It could be fun to try. Pierre takes his newfound responsibility seriously, especially since the wind and waves have driven the sharks into deeper waters until the storm has lifted. There's no way for the divers to reach them there. It's frustrating, but all they can do is wait. I don't think sharks are lurking out in the water wanting to eat human beings. I think that, you know, they're active all of the time and they're constantly hunting. If you present yourself in a similar place, time, and behavior as their prey, they will probably uh, taste you. But, uh, you know, I mean, I've been in the water with the tiger sharks, I've been in the water with lots of other different sharks, and they seem to be more curious than ever aggressive with us. There is a possible lead in the search for the vanished great whites tracking down their main prey animals. As inhospitable as this isolated island may seem, for some creatures, it's paradise and a safe haven. Northern elephant seals enjoy the seclusion. It has saved them from certain extermination at the hands of greedy hunters. Elephant seals are the biggest seals in the world. Bulls can grow to an astonishing six and a half meters and weigh in at up to three and a half tons. Despite their ungainly appearance on land, they are adept underwater acrobats and hunters. Able to pursue fish and octopuses down to an astonishing depth of 600 meters. But out in the open ocean, hunters can quickly become the hunted. This seal has been the recent victim of a vicious attack, a shark attack. 
It's a sure sign that the sharks are back in the coastal waters of Guadalupe. Blood traces show where the injured animal returned to land. But it will survive. Many seals in this colony bear serious scars from shark attacks. They're not entirely without protection on the water. Their blubber acts like a shield, not only against the cold, but also against the jagged teeth of the great white shark. Christian Petro and the crew get ready for a renewed search for the sharks. The injured elephant seal has renewed their hopes of success. And where better to search for sharks than right next to the colonies of their prey? They explore the waters near the shore and have the unique chance to witness the surprising elegance of the seals underwater at close range. It's the first time uh uh, we will be diving with elephant seal, so it's, uh, it's fine. Elephant seal are waiting, and we are waiting for them since 35 years. Using small boats, the divers manage to get close to the forbidding rocky coastline. Underwater, they're quickly greeted by curious Guadalupe fur seals. They show no fear and approach the divers at close range. They are the rarest of the southern fur seals and strictly protected. The team are probably the first humans they've come face to face with for a very long time. Elephant seals are less feisty, but they too show no fear. Perhaps they see the divers as animals similar to themselves, and they wouldn't be far from wrong. We are like them because we breathe at the surface where they're breathing at the same time as we were doing. We were looking at each other on the surface and then putting the head down, they were looking at each other. Uh, it's very funny because we are like them. Huh? We breathe and we, we dive, so um, same kind of animals. Maybe we have longer fins and different suits, but same. But still the team hasn't managed to spot any sharks in the shallow coastal water. Where have they gone? Giving up is not an option, so they use a short break to check their equipment and prepare for the next dive. Then, an unexpected visit. The Mexican Navy is suddenly on board of the research vessel armed to the teeth. 
Christian Petron is alarmed. What do the soldiers want? Could this spell the end of the expedition? The boat is searched from top to bottom. The team's papers checked meticulously and permits examined. No one is allowed in these waters without official permission. Guadalupe is one of the best protected nature reserves in the world. Everyone is nervous. They anxiously await the Navy commander's verdict. Well, we're the Coast Guard, and our job is to stop the drug traffic and illicit activities like shark fishing. Sometimes it's necessary to check people who belong to some TV or magazine who are filming, like you, but they don't have permission. Everything is in order. A sigh of relief ripples through the crew. The soldiers leave them to their shark experiments. The divers quickly take advantage of the remains of the day. They couldn't afford to waste any more time. This break in the bad weather could only be a brief reprieve. but still no sharks. It is a frustrating strain on the team's patience. Pierre tries to raise the shark's curiosity. Perhaps splashing on the water's surface could guide the sharks to them. Something ordinary swimmers and divers should avoid in shark-infested waters at all costs. The three free divers work together. Each one covers the back of another. Should any sharks materialize, they don't want to be taken by surprise. Success. A single great white appears out of the blue. Just one of the free divers will try to approach, while the others watch his back. The cautious tactic pays off. Other sharks join the first. Including a surprise visitor, a fur seal brazenly dives right amongst his predators. He's so quick and agile that the sharks don't stand a chance of catching him. They have to rely on surprise attacks to prey on the seals. Gradually, the sharks appear to be getting used to the divers. They become increasingly curious about the visitors, but neither divers nor sharks drop their guard for even a second. If you want to see how an animal behaves, you need to see how it behaves in the real conditions. If you start to use a cage or devices, you trick the game. Getting this close to the sharks allows the free divers to take detailed photographs of each individual, which Mauricio Hoyos will use to catalog the animals. But the divers have to remain vigilant. The shark in front of them isn't always the only shark around. The shark strategy of attack usually involves a silent approach from behind. William! William! Right behind you! Will has a lucky escape. Out here, just one moment of unwariness could cost a diver his life. Tiffany keeps a wary eye on the divers, who are now encircled by sharks. Meanwhile, Dr. Mauricio Hoyos tries to take advantage of the shark's presence. He wants to fit radio transmitters to some of them from the safety of a floating platform. It forms a crucial part of his research and can give vital clues to decode the shark's hunting behavior. 
the white sharks they feed on seals and they feed on the on, on, on these kind of animals. If they don't uh, control those animals, these animals are going to be like a, a plague. A lot of animals in the Sea of Cortez. We have a lot of California sea lions because now there are not bull sharks or another sharks, and those sea lions are a big problem for fishermen. For instance, actually, my captain is a fisherman, and he told me that it's a big problem when when they are retrieving the nets and they can see all the fish bitten by the California sea lions. And they have, there are hundreds of them, but they are not allowed to do anything because the three different species of pinnipeds are protected in Mexican waters. But we have hundreds of them. And it's because of that, because no sharks in the Sea of Cortez. Facing up to a great white out in the open sea requires an extraordinary amount of self-control. Showing panic or fear could provoke an attack. It's even possible that sharks can perceive the electrical impulses of a beating heart. The great white is a hunter. A uh, great white always arrive in the shadow, always take advantage of his camouflage, and so you have to be very, very aware of his position. And if you establish an eye contact with a great white, no problem. The problem is when you don't have the eye contact with the animal. And uh, every time I've been like a bit surprised by the great white was because I didn't see the animal arriving before. Again and again, sharks suddenly appear out of the blue and swim straight at the divers. They turn away only at the last moment. Every year, about 60 or 70 shark attacks on people are registered worldwide. But in 2009, only about five of these were fatal. Gradually, the divers managed to get extremely close to the sharks. It allows them to build up an invaluable detailed photographic catalog of the predators for Dr. Oyo's research. Shark science has been turned upside down in recent years. For a long time, it had been assumed that the sharks spend most of their time in coastal waters to hunt sea lions and seals. But with the help of high-tech satellite transmitters, it has become clear that they undertake incredible journeys of several thousand kilometers. During these long-distance migrations, they tend to stay at depths of 300 or 500 meters. But so far, scientists have only been able to observe them near the water's surface. The rest of the sharks' lives remain a mystery. Time for the divers to take a break. They have to. Staying in the water too long could mean a fatal dip in their concentration. Boy, that was great. <laughs> Uh, there's a big, it's like four and a half meter. I can show you the photo. At last minute, they turn. I was uh, taking the opportunity to come from under. And uh, because you don't see it coming from under. So it's really coming at you and doesn't stop, doesn't stop at like 50, 60 centimeters from your turns. It's really nice. Very nice. Really interesting. The first time she came right at me, yeah. it, she, it was as soon as I went, <laughs> she, yeah. Yeah, yeah. sorry, she no, started. No. <laughs> like me. Yeah. So. The success of the last few days has given the team enough confidence to attempt the next stage of their expedition, 
to tag the sharks underwater. Since Mauricio's own efforts to fit transmitters have been unsuccessful, this could be a vital chance to get this crucial part of his research underway. He's installed receivers near seal colonies in three bays around Guadalupe. When a shark, fitted with one of his radio transmitters, approaches, they register the signal. The receivers will be retrieved again in a year's time to analyze the data. Mauricio hopes this data will support his theory that the big females are the most prolific seal hunters, since they need the extra energy provided by the seal blubber. If his assumptions are correct, the receivers will have predominantly registered the approach of females, not those of youngsters and males. The transmitters are attached near the back fin using barbed hooks. Fred, Will and Pierre carefully prepare the string that attaches the transmitter to the barb. Transmitters are very expensive and losing any would mean a serious blow to the entire project. To penetrate the tough shark skin, they have to be shot from a harpoon. It takes long years of experience using harpoons to get the aim and moment of release exactly right. But it is a risky undertaking. No one knows how the sharks will react. Pierre seems relaxed, despite the precarious undertaking. Hey, he's always there, waiting for you. He knows that you're coming. Behind you and then the other behind you. I know they know what they're doing. Pretty sure too that they can draw the line when you know it gets a little bit too dangerous. So I hope they know where that line is. But I'm I'm sure they'll they'll be fine. Mauricio Hoyos is hoping for as many sharks as possible to fit a good number of transmitters. Is that another one, or is eyes the same, right? But more sharks in the water means a greater risk for the divers. The crew takes the same approach as before and allows the sharks to get used to them in the water first. The plan is for Will to take a photograph before Pierre tries to tag the first shark. Everything is going to plan. Pierre manages to get an ideal position to shoot his harpoon, but then he hesitates. The chance passes. Fred explains what happened. Mauricio, it's one shark with uh, like tags, but like uh, it's not acoustic type of something. No, but, uh, with, with parasites? Yes. Yeah. yeah maybe it's uh, the feather. It, it was from a satellite transmitter. So now it, it has just the, the parasites, I think. So uh, you want us to tag that one? Yes. If, if you are if yeah. you are sure that it's not an acoustic, it's not an acoustic, right? Uh, we will we be sure, see. but it doesn't it's seem to be an acoustic. It's, it's, maybe it's just a feather with yes. the parasites. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The divers make a second attempt, but just as he reaches the ideal shooting position, Pierre realizes the danger. Will is immediately in front of the shark. Should the shark get aggressive as a result of the shot, Will would be extremely vulnerable. Pierre has to let the shark go a second time. The tagging is turning out to be extremely difficult. Success is not guaranteed. But an experienced hunter knows patience is top of the list. The divers take their time. Perhaps the shark has noticed some tension among the team. Perhaps the long and unfamiliar harpoons have spooked him. He is very cautious. Then Pierre has another chance. It's a good hit. But the hook didn't bite. The transmitter drops along the line into the depth. The shark has been spooked for good and disappears. 
Will has found another target and prepares to shoot. While Pierre retrieves his transmitter, Will takes a shot. But the angle is not ideal. The line doesn't release the transmitter. But Will is lucky. Eventually, the line releases the transmitter and the shark disappears. A nervous, aggressive shark is unpredictable. This could have ended very badly. But the transmitter is fixed and well placed. Now everything goes smoothly, and the team managed to tag two large females. Did you tag it? Yes. The big female? The big one. Excellent. It's yeah. a female, right? Huh? It's a female. Oh, yeah, it's huge. <laughs> Excellent. Where are the other tags? We have photos. Left and right. Perfect. Oh, the other shark is She's here. She's not there. She's back. Hey, so you take a picture with the transmitter on it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. William has a uh, uh, video. Okay. And now I'm going to take pictures. Excellent. This shot was perfect. The transmitter is securely in place and releases the line immediately. Mauricio is elated. Yes, of course. It's a big female. And I think that they are feeding on the seals, the big females. I have seen a lot of females feeding on seals, so this is perfect for the, for the array that I said a few days ago. It has been an exceptional accomplishment. Getting any closer than this to great white sharks in their own element is virtually impossible. Dr. Oyos is particularly interested in hearing as much as possible about the team's underwater observations of the shark's behavior. And what about the behavior of that big female? She was very quiet. Uh, she was coming very close, but uh, in a very uh, soft manner, uh, approaching and not at all inquisitive, just curious. And uh, we could spend time with her swimming alongside. Uh, we had a lot of fun with that shark. Always on the surface with yes, yes, yes. I mean, not at all aggressive. Near, near no, near and sometimes uh, with the, the fin and the tail outside yeah. of the water, but we could cruise with her. She was yeah. totally accepting us. It was yeah. oh, very nice. Here's. Oh, that's, is that the, the transmitter? Yeah. yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. Perfect tagging. <laughs> the and correct on the left side, you can see exactly. that she's yes, yes. totally clean. And look at the size of the transmitter. It looks like <laughs> it looks yeah, like this. Tiny. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, we have it on film also, the tagging, yeah? uh, placement yeah. of the transmitters. I don't know that female. Maybe she's new. Mm -hmm. I don't know that female. And this afternoon we saw another big female, huh? new, no tag on it, but huh? we couldn't uh, get Bigger it. than this one? Or? No, same size, but uh, not as fat. Thank you very much for your help. Without your help, this couldn't be impossible because I had been trying to tag the sharks for one week and they have been really deep all the time. Yeah. So for me, I was there in my skiff and waiting, waiting <laughs> and nothing at the surface. But I saw the, the sharks when they were mm -hmm. swimming below me like 10 meters. So we tagged two big females today, mm -hmm. and that's what I want, because I have seen the big females feeding on the seals. And that's why I said this array of Sunnibush in front of the seal colony. Okay. With those transmitters, we are going to know the three-dimensional movements of the sharks when they are looking for the, for the seals. Let us know when you have results. I will, next year. be really curious. Yeah. Next year. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> they are convinced their experiences with the sharks can do something towards changing their reputation as bloodthirsty killers. You, you can really explain to the people they are nice animals because all the picture you see of great white sharks and the film it's always with the mouth open going at the camera but you have to know it if they do that it's because you had a lot of blood and bait in the water yeah. sometimes even uh, bait on the camera or on the cage so they <coughs> go there and uh, yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. have like kind of spectacular and images yeah. but when they don't have bait they're just curious they want to see what we are and they stay for yeah. 15 20 minutes yeah. then they are gone but yeah, they never really open the jaws the only time we have was a little bit worried is uh, when uh, William tagging the shark. When I saw the shark, I, I said, oh my God, it, 
tech, une de passage. Mais, ouf, il est gone. But uh, it's only time I was very worried because the shark was shy. And the eye is not dark. Ah, it's you saw black. Black. it's yeah. blue. Yeah. It's yeah. blue. The great white shark yeah. eye is uh -huh. blue. It's, it's not like, black. You, Everybody you says they have like a deep a song. black blue, eye yeah. without any expression. If you really go close to a great white shark, you will see it's a black eye with a blue circle and it's absolutely beautiful. What we do really helps uh, people to have a different perspective about uh, about sharks. That island is a very nice place for the great white, but perhaps one, one of the last. So humans have to take care about sea life and the watermen we are have to show that shark is not dangerous. He's curious and he lives in the sea. He is in his place. So we have to respect that. We have just visitors. Yeah. It's possible their groundwork will have paved the way to new groundbreaking insights into the true nature of one of the greatest hunters in the sea.